The book is really about the future of thinking and how we have this handful of companies, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, who've become these really imposing gatekeepers who shape our reality. They shape the way that we get news. We're going to be inhabiting the virtual realities that they create. And my book is really expressing the anxieties that I have about the overwhelming presence that these companies have in this world, that they, the, the power that they've accumulated is not the power of a normal corporation. The power that they've accumulated is one that has enormous influence to shape markets, to shape news, to shape information, and therefore to shape democracy. And the book I wrote kind of describes how these companies came into being and describes how some of our most idealistic expectations for technology have turned into something extremely dark. The problem is, is that they have tremendous ability to shape the way that we think, the way that we filter the world, the way that we absorb culture. If they were just companies, maybe we shouldn't be so concerned about them, but they play an incredibly vital role in the health of our democracy. And it's not just the size of these companies that we should be worried about. Their ambitions are to essentially control the entirety of human existence. And I know that sounds outrageous, but it's true. They're trying to stay with us from the moment that we wake up in the morning until the moment that we go to bed at night. They want to become our personal assistants. They want to become the vehicles to deliver us news, entertainment, to track our health. They want to obey our every beck and call through Amazon Alexa and Google Home. The corporate titans have always wanted to control everything. John D. Rockefeller. Well, you're right. I mean, we've always had ambitious corporations, but we've never had everything stores and everything companies in quite this sort of way. And I think the crucial difference is that John D. Rockefeller never really set out to control the way that you think or to shape the way that you think. 50 years ago, the way that we consumed food was revolutionized. We began eating processed foods, and it seemed amazing. German, Chinese, Italian. And then we woke up many, many decades later and realized that food was engineered to make us fat. And I think that these companies are doing the same thing with the stuff that we ingest through our brains. They're attempting to addict us, and they're addicting us on the basis of data. Four's book is called World Without Mind, The Existential Threat of Big Tech. He says one problem is that companies like Facebook, Google, Apple, and Amazon control so much of the market. They pose as these neutral marketplaces, yet when they have their own things to sell, they give them special advantages. We saw this with Yelp and Google, where Yelp was this great way to get recommendations about what restaurant to go to. And it used to be when you type in a restaurant name into Google, the Yelp review was the first thing that came up. Well, Google saw that this was a good business to be in, and so they started to publish their own user reviews of restaurants. And suddenly, those leapfrogged over Yelp. And so I think we accept these platforms as being neutral. They pose as neutral. Even if you look at their looks, a search engine seems like it's a mechanical thing, but it's not a mechanical thing. It imposes the economic interests of these companies on the platform, and it imposes their values on the platform as well. Part of the underlying challenge seems to be that all of these companies, Amazon, Google, Facebook, use algorithms to right. decide what to show us. And we don't know what those algorithms are. Yeah. And if we don't think about those algorithms, we can assume that this is some kind of impartial objective analysis when really it's not. Right. All these algorithms are constructed by human beings to serve human purposes. They're systems. And these systems are devised in order to create certain outcomes. And so the fact that they're so invisible, I think actually enhances their power because most people have the dimmest awareness, if any awareness at all, that Facebook is being patterned to try to give them some information above others. Right now, Facebook is obsessed with promoting video because that's where money is to be had. So if right now, Facebook is loading up your newsfeed in order to give you much more video. 
There are all these media companies, I bet NPR is one of them, that makes certain commitments to certain editorial processes and uh, investments in, in editorial apparatus in, in order to achieve certain results on Facebook. Because Facebook brings a lot of traffic. It's where users are. And then when Facebook somewhat capriciously decides to change its strategy, it hurts all the organizations that are dependent upon Facebook. In this book, you don't just argue that we should be clear-eyed about the costs of these free services. You argue that this is actually an existential threat. Explain what that threat is. So if you're of a certain age, you have a good appreciation for the ways in which we've all become a little bit cyborg. I grew up using maps and having a sense of direction, and now I have a phone. I used to try to remember numbers, and now I have I, I can just call them up instantly. And that's that's great. But what's happening right now is that we're in a phase of human evolution where we're merging with machines. But why and, is that a these, bad thing? Like, so what? So these companies, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but we're not just merging with machines. We've been merging with tools since the beginning of human evolution, and arguably that's one of the things that makes us human beings. But what we're merging with are machines that are run by companies that act as filters for the way in which we interact and process the world. And so we're, the, the values of those companies become our values. We become dependent on these companies in a way in which we've never really been dependent on companies before. And this could all work out in a utopian, beautiful sort of way, or it could unfold as a dystopian sci-fi nightmare. <laughs> and I just think that because the stakes are so high, we have to be extra skeptical. In your book, you say this all began <laughs> with Hippies, basically. Yeah. A hippie. Yeah. Stuart Brand, the whole Earth catalog. Yeah. So one of the fantastic things about Silicon Valley is that it's both the birthplace of technology and it was one of the birthplaces of the counterculture. The internet and the personal computer were going to be like the communes where we would all be networked together and we would be able to achieve this state of global consciousness. And it was utterly benign. It was a benign vision, right? It was a beautiful vision. And so the idea of this network in one context could be could be this hippie dream, but in another context could be the basis for the biggest monopolies in human history. And that's what we've got? That's what we've got. Are there regulations, are there checks to make sure that, for example, Facebook doesn't manipulate the outcome of an election or Amazon doesn't bury the search results for a book that's critical of Amazon? So the internet was invented in an age when uh, our entire approach to regulation has been extremely lax. And so you'd think, OK, there must be a law on the books that governs how these corporations can handle our data. Well, you could kind of pull pieces of code. I mean, U.S. code from here and there. Not digital code, <laughs> Not digital code. legal code. Legal code uh, that, that shows you know, maybe instances where companies could potentially cross boundaries, but there really isn't a coherent approach that we have to regulating these companies. And so they have an incredible amount of freedom. Europe is way ahead of the U.S. on regulating these companies. They've levied fines against Google for mm -hmm. monopolies and other things like that. What's going on here? In my view, the Europeans are acting more American than the Americans, that there's this proud American tradition of worrying about the power of communication companies. That going all the way back to the founding, we've tried to limit the power of monopolies that played a role in our democracy. And so even with the US Postal Service to take the first communications monopoly in the United States, we didn't let them get into the telegraph business. And when Western Union got a monopoly in the telegraph business, we were careful not to let them get into telephony. And so when I look at what the Europeans are doing and the concerns that they're showing for privacy, which is a concept that Americans essentially invented, when you look at their concern for uh, preserving a competitive marketplace, which is a very, very American concept, I say, bravo, thank you for behaving in, in, in a very apple pie and baseball sort of way. There's so much convenience that has come to our life because of the internet. And there's also, it, it actually, it does empower people in, in some of the ways that it's been advertised to have empowered people, but they're cost. And 
one of the things about these creations is that they, they're just kind of magical. And the magical quality of them means that we just don't apply our normal, normal human skepticism to them. And I, it's just, it shouldn't be so hard for us to say, these creations are amazing, but there's also real downsides for them. And the downsides are pretty major. And I think it's possible for us to start to think about how we move technology forward in a way that tries to capture the good while minimizing the bad. There are many fights that are more important than the internet, right? There's fights about gender equality. There's fights about racial equality. There's fights about climate change. There's fights about income inequality. And all of those fights are more important than the destiny of the internet, except that the internet is the battlefield on which all of those fights will be fought. There's no uh, turf that is more foundational than that fight. If we're going to have all those other fights, we have to keep the internet free and fair and open.